The Bible contains amazing secrets that would only be revealed to and understood by those who live in the end times. We are the lucky ones who just happen to find ourselves in those times. The Bible is also a supernatural book, one of a kind. It is the only source of truth in a world that has become full of lies and deceit over the past few years especially. In this video series we will do a somewhat technical analysis of a very important secret that has been preserved in God's word specifically for us would be in a position to unlock its meaning. The mysterious secret that was specifically written for us was pointed out to Daniel in the following passage. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, and made white, and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Contrary to the belief that the Bible is merely a compilation of books authored by approximately forty individuals spanning nearly two thousand years, it possesses unique attributes that distinguish it from any other historical work. Merely reading the surface text may not unveil these supernatural qualities, but they serve as validating evidence of its divine origin, akin to authentication marks that differentiate genuine currency from counterfeits. Before exploring exclusive Bible secrets, let's reflect on the significance of trusting the truth of God's Word. One authenticating aspect deliberately embedded by the Bible's ultimate author is the presence of equidistant letter sequences. These sequences convey messages on subjects that emerged centuries after the Bible was written. Through these hidden messages we are shown that the author inspiring approximately 40 people to pen this book possessed knowledge of future events and exists beyond the confines of time and space. Over the years, attempts to disprove the Bible's authenticity and uniqueness by debunking its codes have been made. Some have provided examples of equidistant letter sequences from secular books of similar or larger sizes than the Bible. These examples typically consist of codes ranging from 8 to 12 characters in length, falling within the realm of statistical probability, and they are to be expected. Unfortunately, when presented with evidence like this, many seize further investigation, believing that the Bible codes lack uniqueness and require no further study. The situation brings to mind the encounter between Moses and Pharaoh's magicians. If someone argued that the magicians could perform everything Moses did, thereby dismissing the significance of God's power, would that statement hold truth? While Pharaoh's magicians could replicate the initial two plagues, they ultimately failed to match Moses' abilities. They, like other Egyptians, suffered boils and were powerless to prevent the subsequent plagues from even affecting them. Similarly, those who claim that codes hidden in the Bible are the same as those that exist in other books fail to recognize the vast disparity. In the Bible's case, some codes range from 100 to 300 characters addressing contemporary real-life subjects and individuals who did not exist during the Bible's writing. These discoveries surpass statistical probability and often span and wrap around the entire Old Testament multiple times. When considering the requirements for such an achievement, certain conclusions emerge. Firstly, to explain these codes found in God's Word, one must understand that the writer of the supernatural book exists beyond the confines of time and space. Only someone existing outside of time and space could accomplish this feat. Secondly, if even a single letter were displaced, this feature would cease to exist, underscoring the words of Jesus when he said the following. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. If you are unfamiliar with ELS codes, here is a simple example to illustrate their workings. Within this sentence, 
Rudy explains that each code is a case of adding every fourth letter to form a word or sentence. An explanation is given regarding the discovery of ELS codes. While a second hidden message is embedded, can you spot it? By extracting every fourth letter and forming a new sentence, you can reveal the meaning. The hidden message we observed in this example comprises just 11 characters, making it relatively simple to decipher or locate in ordinary books. Bible code software allows for the targeted search of specific words or phrases, displaying passages from the Bible where the search term intersects vertically with various passages horizontally at a specific letter skip. In 2007, during my personal exploration of Bible codes, I came across an article in which an individual involved in oil exploration referenced Genesis 49 as a basis for searching for oil in Israel. Intrigued, I used blessings of the deep as a search term within the Bible code software to see what would emerge. Not only did the search term appear, but when examining the letters preceding and following it vertically, it revealed the phrase, great are the blessings of the deep sank down. Remarkably, this search term appeared at an interval or letter skip of 857,225 letters. What makes this even more peculiar is that this search term shares a letter with the passage from Genesis 49 that inspired the search in the first place. The phrase, blessings of the deep that coucheth beneath, is mentioned in Genesis 49. The fact that the two phrases convey almost the same message and share a letter with almost 30 million characters involved in the search is far beyond statistical probability. While I have discovered numerous intriguing terms related to the article and Genesis 49 within this matrix, there are likely many more. However, one must have specific terms in mind to search for before they can be identified. Similar properties can be found in the New Testament. Dr. Ivan Penin, a Russian mathematician, dedicated 40 years of his life to studying the numerical design within the New Testament. One fascinating aspect he discovered is that each of the 27 books in the New Testament contains words exclusive to that particular book that are not used elsewhere in the New Testament. Remarkably, the number of words exclusive to each book of the New Testament is divisible by seven. The chances of this occurring by mere coincidence, rather than being a design feature, are extremely slim. Even with a conservative estimation, assuming a maximum of 10 unique words per book, the likelihood of all 27 numbers being divisible by 7 is a staggering 1 chance in 1 with 27 zeros. In an ELS study conducted by Bible Code researchers, they explored Buddhism and uncovered a 108-character code consisting of seven sentences containing a message that would be very familiar to adherents of this faith. It is astonishing that a code regarding a religion that did not exist during much of the Bible's writing would be hidden within it. Moreover, this code wraps around the Old Testament more than nine times. Even the number 108 is connected to Buddhism and represents the most important number in this religion. This number also represents the beads on their mala, a string of beads used for mantras. This discovery demonstrates that the author of the Bible possessed profound knowledge of a religion yet to be established and encoded this information centuries before its inception. The fact that this code wraps around the Old Testament more than nine times further reinforces the meticulous preservation of every single letter in God's word, as the code would cease to exist with even a single added or removed letter. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. I will only touch on these examples for now, but there are numerous others worth exploring. If you wish to delve deeper into these topics, I have written a book titled Factual Faith, Belief Founded on Truth, in 2011. It delves into these and other remarkable qualities of God's Word with greater detail. The book is available electronically for free, and you can obtain a copy from the provided link in the description below. Understanding the incredible supernatural qualities preserved within the Bible over a millennia makes it easier to wholeheartedly trust its message without any doubt. 
Consequently, I firmly hold to the perspective that God's word is a unified whole. Our doctrine should align with everything conveyed in this extraordinary book. If we adopt a doctrine that excludes certain portions of the Bible, we deviate from the narrow path. The truth cannot be obtained if even a single letter is disregarded or omitted when constructing our doctrines. In my study of God's word, I have found this to be true over the years. Many aspects mentioned in the New Testament require the explanatory information provided in the Old Testament for complete understanding. Unfortunately, there are many today who selectively read God's word focusing only on aspects that align with their doctrine. They refer to this division as rightly dividing God's word rather than ensuring their doctrines align with the entirety of God's word. For instance, when discussing the resurrection of the dead, Paul mentions Christ as the first fruits of those who slept, and an order that will follow at Christ's coming. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. The explanatory information found in Leviticus 23 is essential for comprehending Paul's reference. Without it, one would lack an understanding of Paul's intended meaning. It is this lack of awareness that leads many to mistakenly perceive that first fruits mentioned as encompassing the entire barley harvest, which contradicts the details presented in Leviticus 23. By examining these passages, we gain the required insights into Paul's description. Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath the priest shall wave it. According to this passage, the first fruits are represented by a single sheaf of the crop, indicating that it cannot symbolize the entire harvest. However, many mistakenly associate the first fruits mentioned by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 with the entire barley harvest. Such an interpretation fails to align with the model presented in God's word. It is important to note that the remaining portions of the crop are still in the process of ripening when the first fruits are gathered. Instructions for dealing with the remainder of the harvest can also be found in Leviticus 23. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. When Paul states that those who belong to Christ will be resurrected at his coming, we know that he refers to the owner's portion or the second portion of the same harvest. Additionally, there is a third portion, a portion that remains behind during this harvest, which becomes the rightful possession of a new owner, as mentioned in Leviticus, referring to the poor and stranger. All these portions are part of a unified harvest known as the barley or faith harvest. I have created a five-part series on the harvest and temple models, exploring their connection to the first resurrection. If you haven't seen it yet, you can access it through the provided link in the description below. When we grasp the coherence and interdependence of every aspect in God's word, our perception of the Bible will be forever transformed. Now, let us return to Daniel 12 and reconsider what Gabriel conveyed to Daniel, extracting valuable insights from this passage. It's important to note that the word sacrifice does not appear in the original text and was inserted by translators. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, 
there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. For those living in the end times, this passage holds immense significance. We understand that when God speaks, His words hold true, and we can trust everything written in His word, including the insight shared in this passage. Gabriel informs Daniel that the meaning of his words would only be fully grasped by those living in the time of the end. Therefore, even though scholars throughout the centuries have studied this passage, if they did not live in the end times, they would not have obtained a correct understanding of its meaning, just as Daniel himself did not comprehend its meaning. This passage is one among several that discuss the abomination of desolation and provide associated time frames. To comprehend what our Heavenly Father is revealing to us, we must consider every aspect of His Word, ensuring that our conclusions align with other passages and do not contradict them, and that is what we will do next. In the following sections, we will explore related passages connected to the revelations given to Daniel. By doing so, we can accurately position the events described by Gabriel and ensure consistency with other passages in God's Word. I find this understanding to be incredibly exciting, and I hope you will also be inspired and blessed by the insight shared. First, let us explore what else God's word reveals concerning Gabriel's explanation to Daniel. In Daniel 8, we encounter the following passage, and once again, it is important to note that the word sacrifice is not present in the original texts. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto the certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The first aspect one has to consider is the addition of the word sacrifice to this passage and others by translators as it does not exist in the original texts. This, in my opinion, is the first evidence of Gabriel's statement that only those who live in the end times would receive an understanding of what is said. The translators added the word sacrifice based on an incorrect understanding of this passage's meaning, as Gabriel's message had nothing to do with the sacrifice. The daily that is referenced in these passages point to that which is constant or perpetual, and that which people would perceive as normal. So when we encounter the word daily in these passages, what Gabriel is referring to is perpetual normalcy. How often have we not heard people speaking about returning to normal over the past three years? From this section we gather that a person will arise who will exalt himself, who will receive the assistance of a host, and will be responsible for disrupting normal daily life on a global scale. This passage suggests that truth will be suspended, and this individual will be aided supernaturally in dismantling the status quo, propagating falsehoods and achieving success in these endeavors. In today's world, there are several potential candidates who could fit this description. It appears to describe someone of high authority deeply involved in witchcraft, given the mention of receiving assistance from a host to bring about global change, and suppress the truth and having success in these. I believe this host that is mentioned in this passage refers to the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and the first horseman's description in Revelation fits right in with Gabriel's description. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Furthermore, within the passage from Daniel, two saints discuss the duration of the vision regarding taking away perpetual normalcy and the transgression of desolation. They inquire about how long it will take for the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot, and a period of 2300 days is provided. 
It is crucial to note that in this passage the abomination of desolation is referred to as a transgression, rather than specifically an object placed in a particular location. This distinction should be carefully observed. Additionally, the period of 2300 days associated with this vision must align with other prophecies concerning the end times, particularly Jesus' warnings to the people of Judea who would witness the abomination that causes desolation standing in the holy place. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. It is important to carefully analyze the passages in Daniel, the Gospels, and Revelation. If the abomination of desolation is only placed in the holy place when observed by those in Judea, it would imply that there are an additional 2,300 days following this event, during which the sanctuary and the host will be trampled underfoot, as indicated by the information provided by the two saints. However, other passages in God's word that explain the sequence of events during the end times help us to understand that the 2,300 day period does not begin when those in Judea witness the abomination standing in the holy place. Instead, this event marks the conclusion of the 2,300 days. A clear reason for this is that the two witnesses are seen dead in the streets of Jerusalem as Israel is about to flee into the wilderness, and their testimony coincides with the trampling of the outer court of the temple, or the third portion of the faith harvest. Therefore, it is logical to position Israel's recognition of the abomination standing in the holy place at the end of this period, not at the beginning. Additionally, according to Revelation 12, once the remnant of Israel escapes into the wilderness, they will be under God's protection for 1,260 days. This time frame does not provide enough days for the 2,300 day period to commence when Israel flees into the wilderness. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. The two witnesses also have a period of 1,260 days assigned to them, during which they will testify. Once their testimony is complete, they will be killed by the beast that emerges from the bottomless pit. This event also signifies the culmination of the trampling of the outer court of God's temple. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angels stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. Note that the two witnesses have a specific task assigned to them, which they must complete before they can be killed. The duration of their ministry aligns with the period during which the outer court is being trampled underfoot, providing a clear connection to the statement made by the two saints in the book of Daniel regarding the trampling of the sanctuary. Additionally, we can gain further insight into the ministry of the two witnesses by examining Zechariah of chapter 4, as both passages mention the presence of two olive trees, establishing a connection between these passages. Then answered I and said unto him, 
What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick, and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again, and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me, and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. We know that the parable of the ten virgins addresses the situation where the foolish virgins lacked oil in their vessels when the bridegroom arrived. The wise then direct them to obtain oil from those who have oil to dispense. This account can be found in Matthew 25, and it is clearly connected to the testimony of the two witnesses who will provide oil to the foolish virgins or the left-behind church, which will become the outer court that is trampled underfoot during the tribulation. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. The two witnesses fulfill the role of providing oil to those seeking it during the period when the outer court of God's temple is being trampled underfoot. Furthermore, Revelation 11 describes the fate of the two witnesses after they lay down their lives, and also provides associated events that we need to take notice of. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and an half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and an half the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. In this passage it is revealed that the bodies of the two witnesses will be visible in the streets of Jerusalem for a period of three and a half days, after which they will be resurrected and taken up to heaven. At this time a powerful earthquake will occur, causing fear among the remnant of Israel. By attentively considering God's word, we can establish connections between multiple passages based on the information provided in a single passage that links those passages together. In this case, we witness the remnant of Israel at the time of the end being fearful due to an earthquake that occurs in Israel. This same event is also depicted in Zechariah chapter 14. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day, that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, 
In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. In this passage we can discern the cause of the earthquake and gain insight into Israel's flight into the mountains, described from a slightly different perspective. It is crucial to consider all the details provided in the Bible regarding this significant day, to fully grasp its significance. The timing of Israel's flight aligns with the return of their Messiah and his arrival, which is further elaborated upon in Zechariah 12. Let us examine the following verses from Zechariah 12 to delve deeper into Israel's reaction to their Messiah's arrival. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him, as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. The traditional interpretation of Christ's second coming is that it occurs right at the end of the Great Tribulation, or at the end of Israel's protection in the wilderness. But there are some issues with this view that should already be evident from the passages that we have discussed, even though this view is what is generally accepted among scholars. When one believes that Jesus only returns at the end of Israel's protection in the wilderness, one also has to believe that Israel would know through faith and without seeing Jesus with their eyes that it is he who is providing them with protection in the wilderness. And this presents us with another problem. In Hosea, we see that God says that he would return to his place after being rejected by his chosen nation during his time as the suffering servant on earth, and that he would only return to them once they acknowledged their offense. We read about this in Hosea chapter 5. I will go and return to my place, till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me early. The passages from Revelation and Zechariah reveal that Jesus will return during a momentous earthquake, coinciding with the remnant of Israel fearing and fleeing into the wilderness after crying out to their true Messiah to save them. This event will occur at the peak of their affliction, prior to their entry into the wilderness. It is important to note that God's protection of the remnant would not truly be protection if they experienced affliction throughout their time in the wilderness. Therefore, Israel's affliction is positioned to coincide with the two witnesses' testimony. God allows Israel to endure affliction until they recognize and acknowledge their offense, which is the rejection of their Messiah, which they will continue to reject up to the point where the two witnesses are killed. Throughout the time leading up to this point, Israel will mistakenly believe that the Antichrist is their true Messiah. According to God's word, Israel cannot recognize their genuine Messiah without physically seeing him as Israel is described as a nation with no faith, and faith involves having evidence of things unseen, it follows that Israel can only come to know their Messiah by seeing him in the flesh. Zechariah 12 and 14 shows us that their eyes will behold their true Messiah when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, causing the earthquake during their flight into the mountains. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. In Deuteronomy 32, it is stated that Israel is a nation without faith. This emphasizes the distinctiveness of Israel as a nation belonging to a different harvest, specifically the wheat harvest. The wheat harvest represents a people who do not possess faith. This is the main distinction between the barley and the wheat. The barley represented those who believed that Jesus is the Son of God without seeing him with their eyes. That harvest time ends at the time when the two witnesses are killed, and this also marks the start of the next harvest, which is specifically intended for Israel. If Israel lacks faith and cannot recognize Jesus as their Messiah without seeing him in the flesh, then how will they receive his protection in the wilderness? If Jesus were to return to the earth only at the end of their wilderness protection, someone else would likely receive the glory for their deliverance, just as Israel gave the glory to a golden calf for their escape from Egypt, and while Moses was on the mountain receiving God's instructions. 
and the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. Revelation 11.13 proves to us that the fleeing remnant gives the glory to the God of heaven when the Mount of Olives is split and their Messiah rescues them from assured destruction. If they are a nation without faith and who cannot have evidence of that which is not seen, how would they be able to glorify God without seeing their Messiah in the flesh? In my opinion, the process of Israel's eyes being opened will begin when they realize that the Antichrist is not their true Messiah likely triggered by the deaths of the two witnesses and the culmination of the abomination of desolation. Daniel provides specific details about this, which I will discuss shortly. At the time of the two witnesses' deaths, Israel will be undergoing their most severe affliction ever. Israel, who will at this point represent the remaining remnant of humanity on the earth, will face the threat of annihilation, prompting Israel to cry out to their true Messiah when they discover that the Antichrist is an imposter. When Jesus hears their cries of distress, he will swiftly come down to their rescue, saving them from certain destruction that would have wiped out the last remnants of uncorrupted flesh on the earth. God's word also reveals that two-thirds of the nation will perish during Israel's affliction, surpassing the devastation Israel experienced during the Second World War. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. In this passage, we witness God's promise to hear Israel when they undergo their affliction and call upon His name. As Israel flees into the mountains, the Mount of Olives will be split by the arrival of Jesus, and all of Israel will recognize Him as their Messiah, and He will receive the glory for their rescue. They will then enter His protection during this time and remain in the wilderness for 1,260 days. Another crucial aspect to consider is the period that Jesus promised would be shortened in order to save some lives or some flesh. We have to understand where this occurs to understand Gabriel's explanation to Daniel. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Based on the passages that we have examined, it becomes evident where the shortening of days will take place. As discussed in previous discussion on the harvest and temple models, those who will repopulate the earth during Christ's millennial reign in mortal bodies will all come from the nation of Israel. This period corresponds to the wheat harvest which is assigned to Israel during the millennial reign of Christ. Additionally, according to Leviticus 27, any individual from the barley or faith harvest who becomes the property of a new owner during the tribulation period, referred to as the tribulation saints in Revelation, must be put to death in order to remain holy to God. This requirement is shown to be fulfilled in Revelation 6 and 20. If any believer from the barley or faith harvest remains alive on earth at the time of Jesus' return, they will no longer be considered holy to Him. It is noteworthy how Leviticus 27 outlines this requirement that applies to the third portion of the harvest and temple, which is subsequently applied to the tribulation saints, or those with faith in Jesus as being the Son of God in the book of Revelation. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord! 
Holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So the only mortal flesh that would need to be saved, and for which the days would have to be shortened, is that of the nation of Israel, as they will repopulate the millennium. The specific time that would require shortening is the period of their affliction, which would reach its peak just before they flee into the wilderness. Once they are under the protection of their Messiah in the wilderness, there will be no more affliction or danger that they will face, and therefore there would be no need to shorten the 1260 days assigned to this period after their Messiah rescues them. In Daniel chapter 8, where the two saints discuss the trampling of both the sanctuary and the host during a period of 2300 days, it should now be evident that this period cannot start when Israel flees into the wilderness. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we have the following additional evidence. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The period of 2,300 days represents more than six years, and if the Antichrist is destroyed by the brightness of Jesus' return, we can confidently conclude that the 2,300 days also end when Jesus returns and the Antichrist is destroyed. The timing of the Antichrist's demise is clearly provided in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This marks the moment when both the sanctuary and the host are trampled underfoot, and this occurs when Israel flees into the mountains and Jesus' feet touch the Mount of Olives. God's word provides various time frames that pertain to the end times. Some of these periods are also given specific names such as the beginning of sorrows which signifies the time leading up to the time of the end, and provides further insight into how the 2,300 days are positioned. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. With the information we now have, we can piece together the different end-time periods mentioned in God's word. While I acknowledge the possibility of error, I believe there is strong biblical support for what I am sharing, and if you can point out where I am contradicting God's word, please do so in the comment section and please provide scripture that supports your objections. Gabriel informed Daniel that the wise living in the end times would understand the meaning of his words. Furthermore, it is important to note that the correct understanding would have been kept from anyone who did not live in the end times due to God's seal placed on this information. And this explains the word sacrifice that translators inserted into the text, not understanding the riddle correctly. It would also be futile to consult the interpretation of those who gave their opinions on this prior to the start of the end times. In the next video we will look at how these time frames fit together, keeping in mind that we have to align them in such a way that they do not contradict any passages in God's word. And this will unlock Gabriel's secret that our Heavenly Father left to those who would live in the end times. Those people, of course, are us. I hope that you will join me for the next session as it promises to be an amazing eye-opener that I believe will bless all those who have been longing for the return of our King.